Welcome to uh, the week three. Look on top of your notes, you will we'll see the very, very cheerful information that this is part one, part one of the Inquisition, and of course the Black Plague. People all go home, and when people ask me what you talked about in church today, you can tell them, oh, the Inquisition is the Black Plague. And everyone will most, most definitely want to come to this church because it's so cheerful and light. And, uh, <laughs> And as I think I mentioned to Mark's week, I'd like to be able to tell you, well, don't worry, get through this, and from here on in, it's all going to be sunshine and roses alongside the country. It's, uh, I don't know, I was just telling you, when we study church history, at least from a human perspective, there are no angels in this story. Um, let's begin the word of prayer. The public the thanks and we praise for the multitudinous blessings that we pour out into our lives. For as we have gathered here in your holy house, we ask that your spirit of truth might prevail. We ask that you give us open minds, open hearts, that even as we study history, that your spirit might be at work, guiding us in those good works which you have prepared for us, by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Okay. So just, just a little bit of review. The last two weeks we've been we've been studying the Crusades, um, and uh, I, I kind of synopsized, you know, I, I realized that handing you just reams and, 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 and reams of paper with with thousands of words on it. And I, I really don't expect you to so unless it turns out you're really into it, then you'll study it, and uh, maybe you'll have your own church or something. But a couple of things you, you, you might want to learn about the Crusades, specifically five things uh, about the Crusades. Um, first of all, is that there, were, there, there were two centuries of warfare, 200 plus years of nearly non-stop warfare. And that's, that's the Crusades. During that time, millions were killed on all sides, and I say all sides because it really, especially as we move through the history of the Crusades, there's not a true side about it. It really is an oversimplification to say it was Christian versus Muslim. Certainly by the time we got to the Fourth Crusade, if you recall, Christianity had turned against itself, which is the next subpoint there. Christendom turns against itself, east versus west. But similar things, interestingly enough, were happening on the Islamic side as well. The Muslim world was no more a monolith than the Christian world. Um, I should also point out, um, uh, my opinion certainly, but also the opinion of most serious scholars who study this, the Crusades were motivated really, at least at the highest levels, Primarily by political ambition and greed. Now, even as I say that, that's, that's not to say that there weren't folks, especially the rank and file, who were not sincere in their belief that they were doing something good. But then again, that's often the case. When folks at the lowest levels believe they have cause, or at least some of them are fighting for is the highest levels, there may be something else entirely at, at play. And finally, what made all of this possible was the largely unquestionable central theocratic power of the church. We're talking about the Middle Ages. By the way, that's a period that spans uh, roughly from the year 500 all the way through to the year 1500, and it's outside the Middle Ages. Really, in many ways, the opposite. Less so as time goes on, it's certain the church holds enormous power throughout that period of time, as we will see in the more studies. Um, and and that, that means that when the church decides something, for the most part, it happens. So while many resources and many lives are being expended in crusades, things are happening uh, back in back in Europe, maybe because 
so much effort is being spent on the Crusades, things begin to happen in Europe almost simultaneously. And we're going to look at a little bit of that today. I've called this the, uh, the Inquisition backdrop, because that's kind of the next thing we're looking at is, is, the, is the Inquisition, and um, it doesn't happen all at once. Um, what's the Inquisition, by the way? Certain people in Spain uh, punishing those who did not uh, believe as they did. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they think about the Inquisition, they are thinking Spanish Inquisition. However, we will not even get to the Spanish part of the Inquisition until next week. We are in. We are still in the European uh, first, the so-called Episcopal. Inquisition, which by the way has nothing to do with the Church of England. I'll explain that in a moment. Then the papal Inquisitions, and, and that goes on for a couple hundred years. When, by the way, did the Inquisition end? Well, Fourteen hundred, late fourteen hundred. I might be right. Technically speaking, the Inquisition ended in nineteen oh six. 1906. And, and, and in that case, it, it in fact didn't actually end. The, the church just changed the name of, of, the, of the organization and its mission. The last execution of the Inquisition took place in, you know, 1826. 1826. The last execution of the Inquisition. So, so we're talking about something which held sway in Western Christendom for an enormous period of time. And we'll, we'll get into it. So, so, what did I write here? Meanwhile, back in Europe. Meanwhile, back in Europe, um, some groups were forming. Some groups that were not in alignment with the Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> One of the most significant of these was a group called the Catholics. Catharsis, from Greek, catharsis, which means, I think it was an English catharsis. Well, close. So catharsis, catharsis is actually cleanse. Uh, you, you talk about something being cathartic, okay? Uh, maybe you had a rough day at work. Not that I did this, but you had a rough day at work, and you go home and you punch a punching bag because it's cathartic, and it keeps you from punching your colleagues or something. Like I said, I like this. But a catharsis is kind of call themselves a catharsis, or at least they, that's what they became to be known as, because they, uh, they looked at the church as it was. And they said this thing is filthy. They, they, they said it is full of corruption. And it is very far from the kingdom of God. Now, the catharsis. Um, they, were, uh, they were Christians in the sense that they, the central focus of their worship and belief was Jesus Christ. Um, they were, however, dualists. Dualists. You know, it doesn't mean they had pistols or thought of bulls or anything. <coughs> dualists, um, well, in all the meanings of that word, um, in general, the dualist is anyone who believes in life has dual properties. In this particular case, the Cathars looked around the world and they said, boy, what a mess. We've got a church that's supposed to be proclaiming the gospel and they're all fighting the wars. We've got rulers that's supposed to be taking care of us. And they're after their own interests. And even those of us who are good people are still all kinds of sinful. And they said, how can this be? After all, if God is good, and if God created the world, and he said it is good, he created man over the world that's very good, how did it get this way? How did it get this way? Now, if you happen to be a Lutheran or a Roman Catholic or any other 
other stripes of Protestants, then somewhere on the tip of your tongue or the back of your mind is this idea of original sin. But the Catharsis said, well, even if that's so, even if it all just started off with one sin, how does a perfect God make a universe where there's even a possibility of sin? Now, Lutherans and Baptists will say, well, but there's free will. The Catharsis had a different idea. And this is at least one of the things that got them in trouble. By the way, not the primary thing. The Catharsis had this idea that the God who made the physical world is not the same God Father of Jesus Christ. The God who made the physical world was, in fact, a demiurge, an embodiment of evil. The, the reason they speculated, and also they believe, that the world is so messed up is because it was made by a flawed spiritual being. The world is flawed because its creator is flawed. Then enter the scene another God who sends Jesus Christ to teach humanity how to become spiritual beings. And needless to say, this didn't go particularly well with the Roman Catholic Church. And they were actually referred to Catharsis as the Church of Satan. So, Catharsis in general were anti sacerdotal what does that mean? It, it, it means they didn't believe in sacerdotalism. By the way, you have some play. Oh, there's something you asked. What is sacerdotal? Sacerdotalism is the belief that upon ordination, one receives an additional blessing above and beyond other Christian people. So in other words, if you become a priest, if you become a bishop, then you are blessed with additional authority, additional power, maybe even additional grace than average Joe Husserl. Sacerdotals. And the Catharsis said, no, that, that, that can't be true. That, 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 that can't be true. It particularly can't be true because just look at the way all these clergy people act. If anything, it's going to be the other way around. You, you, you can see, uh, you can almost imagine the Pope, maybe one of those innocent popes, <laughs> I can't be this poor, but his steam starting to come up from, you know, underneath, uh, you know, the hat. So, the Thars are contrasted with Roman Catholic Church, which has how many sacraments? Thank you. Um, had only one. Something they call the consolation. The consolamentum. The consolation. This basically involves a very brief ceremony, at which point all of a person's sins were washed away. Cleansed, if you will. The difference. The difference, say, between that and the Roman Catholic sacrament of the penitence, or what might be called reconciliation today, is, is, is that the Roman Catholic Church, you could then and today do penance over and over and over again, and in fact, it hurts you. Because the thought was, well, you sinned, and, and, and then you went to your priest, and you confessed your sins, and he gave you penance. Now your sins are forgiven, and then you sin some more, and then so on, it's about your power. Whereas the Bethlehem said, no, not, you just get forgiven once. Once. Now, we don't know everything there is to know about um, uh, Catharist theology. Uh, and the reason I say that is because um, there's a whole lot of I don't want to be mean and nasty and snarly, but I guess I will. 
There's a whole lot of pseudo scholarship out there. And, and, and some of it has to do with our fascination, our, as a culture, fascination with religions. And, and, and it seems every few years people will pick up on something uh, and, 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 they'll, and they'll run with it. And, you know, I, I love the internet in a lot of ways, but I have a mixed relationship with it because in the internet land there are no filters. So, and anybody can publish anything. And, and, and if you do it with enough authority, People will believe. So there's a lot of stuff uh, about the Cathars and other ancient quasi or neo Gnostic movements that seem to have captured people's imaginations. Yes, ma'am. I've never heard of the Cathars. How large a movement was it, and what kind of impact did it have on that church at that time? Well, it was. It was. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about the area you covered. But, but just to kind of answer your question, it involved thousands or tens of thousands. So certainly not a plurality of the Roman Catholic world, but, uh, but, but big enough to be a threat. Uh, it pretty much was extinguished. It was pretty much extinguished by the 14th century. The Inquisition did a fine job of wiping out uh, uh, the Cathars as, 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 as a religion. However, the influence probably is still felt in a number of different ways. Um, in fact, some Protestant churches uh, actually look to the Cathars, at least indirectly, for their inspiration. Um, just to uh, talk about a couple of things uh, a little bit further. Um, the, um, man, I just, I just laid it on thick with a little tagger over here. I hope you're impressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> The Catholic conception, the that right, the Catholic conception of Jesus may have resembled non trinitarian modalistic monarchianism in the West and adoptionism in the East. Yeah. But I mentioned the test? No. I will tell you what that means. The idea, non trinitarian is easy, right? Lutherans, Catholics, uh, most Presbyterians, uh, most Baptists, so oh, Trinitarians, right? I am a Trinitarian. You know, you're, you're tr tr in other words, you believe in a triune God, right? Three co-equal persons, or something like that. Well, non-Trinitarians, no, that's that's silly. How can I be? There's one God. Now. Why then does Scripture talk about God the Father and uh, uh, Jesus? Because God can exist in different modes. That's the modal part of it. Well, that's what at least a modal is type. So, for example, God could exist as a Father. God could also exist as a Son, or God could exist as a Spirit. God could exist in a whole lot of other things. Um, so, so, so that probably had something to do with that converse viewpoint of Jesus. However, there are also thoughts that the Catholic viewpoint of Jesus had something to do with adoptionism. What's adoptionism? Well, just like the name implies. And by the way, that was an idea mostly found in the Eastern Church. It was not the official position of the Eastern Orthodox churches, but they weren't a model of either. It seems like nobody can figure this stuff out. Adoptionism suggests, unlike what your Nicene Creed says, which says what about Jesus? Where did Jesus come from? <laughs> right. Begotten from when? Yeah. When, when? When was Jesus begotten? Yeah. 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 Okay. From eternity, whatever that means. But we know what that means. But adoptionism suggests that at some point, God the Father adopts Jesus. Jesus is a particularly holy man. We got it right. Almost like Noah. 
only more so. And God the Father adopts Jesus. And some adoptions suggest that this is a, a picture of a clear expose of um, uh, Jesus being baptized. Uh, some suggest that it was when Jesus was baptized, using particularly, by the way, as evidence uh, God the Father. According to the Gospel of Mark, the heavens are torn open. Matthew is open, but Mark is dramatic. Torn open. And um, God the Father says, You are my beloved son. So, adoption. Others suggest that it was the Mount of Transfiguration when God adopted Jesus. Still, others suggested it was when Jesus rose from the dead. Because other than Lazarus and all kinds of other people, who ever did that? Especially on his own. Still, others suggest it was when Jesus ascended. That's adoption. And somewhere in there is the converse understanding of Jesus. Um, some scholars compare the Cathars to Western Buddhists because of their view of the doctrine of resurrection comes across more like the incarnation. As a matter of fact, the Cathars, well, a lot of Christians will tell you that the whole point, the whole point is to believe in Jesus so when you die, you go to heaven. Then you go to heaven. Okay, some Christians say that's the whole point. Um, now, I'll just tell you a little more specific. Well, actually, it talks about a resurrection, it gets very complex. But the Cathars would have told you, not like a Buddhist. The whole idea is to stop what they would have called the cycle. Of resurrection. See, they had this idea that you, you, you lived your life and you died and you were resurrected in, in someone else. And the idea was to stop being resurrected in a sinful flesh but eventually become a spirit being. And so that, that was there, that was their idea. Uh, it's kind of a fanciful picture of uh, that. Is there a widespread belief in taking the more hand the animal spirits reincarnation? Is that basically adopted? Um, the, the, the idea of a re reincarnation is, is actually multicultural. It's, it's a real old belief system, as is uh, animism. Animism is a belief that. Uh, Things like this, uh, this bench or the, the sky, the tree, the mountain, things that we usually consider to be without spirits have animas, have a kind of a life to them. And those kind of things all go together, particularly in religions that suggest you don't necessarily have to be reincarnated as a human being, you can be reincarnated as a human being. Well, like this, of course. Well, the members don't know. Sure. Um, so, Cathars. They were pacifists. They abhorred all forms of killing. As, as a result, they were uh, essentially vegans. It's not even modern. They, they would not eat anything that was the product of uh, a sexual union. So, in other words, an animal, how do you make new animals? Well, you don't know anymore. <laughs> but they're not doing any that, okay? Because that's the limit. Um, the, uh, they also uh, were entirely against war for any reason, entirely against capital punishment. Um, they also rejected the taking of oaths. Now, right there in that statement, they were opposed to most of what Christendom stood on. War, uh, governing by fear, and uh, paying votes. So, uh, one more interesting part about this. Uh, 
uh, capitalism, maybe the first uh, truly egalitarian, um, I'm almost going to say, who is with kind of you see, because they, uh, they thought that uh, you most likely had been reincarnated from someone before, and you'd be reincarnated in someone else in the future until you break that cycle, until you become sinners. Now, in your previous life, if, if, if you're a man, if you're a dude, as they say, that wasn't necessarily what you were before. And, and it, 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 so you'll be. Again, and the firm belief that the flesh, the body, really did not matter, men and women were considered equal. That's astounding to the to find it. They considered men and women equal. You have evidence of women rising to the highest ranks of this little sect. So were these people persecuted during the Inquisition? Ah, uh, yes, that's what I'm getting to. That's what I'm getting to. Um, and, and in fact, I'll just say now, I'm going to point this before, like, um, this is the Inquisition backdrop. The reason I'm going to these groups in detail, I, I want to give you some flavor for why, the why of the Inquisition. It, it wasn't necessarily just because up in Rome they got bored. <coughs> What they perceived was a real threat <coughs> for these folks. And it wasn't just Jews and Muslims, which I always thought. <coughs> no, it wasn't just it wasn't just Jews and Muslims. As a matter of fact, the, the, the plurality of, of, of folks who lost their lives or otherwise uh, uh, profoundly affected by the Inquisition were actually uh, people who considered themselves Christians. They did not line up with official. Uh, Orthodox um, Roman Catholic figure. Um, okay, so next you can you can read you can read the rest of you can read the rest of this on your own if you like. The next group, um, Waldensians. That's a um, statue of uh, uh, Peter Waldo. Um, this you might find interesting. Waldensians Christian movements. Cultural group. If you haven't heard of the you probably haven't heard of them either. They started in, they started in, in, in France, moved through to Italy. Um, by the way, they still exist. They still exist. Small numbers. They still exist. Um, you can find the Lenzian communities in southern Italy, Argentina, Germany, United States, and Europe, of all places. Um, see how much of this sounds familiar to you. Well, Dantians held and preached a number of truths that, as they read them from the Bible. Their interpretation of the Bible was important. They said you were justified before God by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Not through penance, not through anything the church said, entirely and completely through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. They believe in a Trinitarian Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They believe in the fall of man. They believe, unlike the Cathars, they believe that there was one God who created the universe who was perfect. How there's also free will and then abuse the free will. Um, they believe in the incarnation of Christ. In other words, that Jesus was God incarnate. And they denied purgatory, which, by the way, was a, a relatively popular doctrine by this time period. They denied purgatory as, all by words, the invention of the Antichrist. And in my way, by extension, was considered the papacy to be the Antichrist. So, so that's that's the whole Nazis. Now. If, if, if none of that sounds familiar to you, I have to have a serious talk with Pastor Mark. <laughs> because what you should see in there, at least in its broadest sense, is a theological take 
very similar to that of the Reformation. Um, well, Dempsey has also taught that temporal offices, in other words, uh, political offices, or other places of, of worldly authority, were not to be held by preachers of the gospel. They held that saints' relics, you know, fragments of bone from some saint this or saint that, were nothing but most likely rotten bones of suspect origin. They felt that going on a pilgrimage, other than being extremely expensive, really served no real spiritual purpose. Um, unlike the Cathars, they felt that you could eat meat whenever you wanted to, including on Friday, by the way, if you had an appetite for it. Um, they felt that holy water was no more efficacious than any other water, the rain, the river, the what have you. Um, they, uh, they felt that you could pray in a barn, a field, in your home, just as effectively as you could pray in a church. And finally, they rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation. And just as a reminder, transubstantiation states that the earthly elements, bread and wine, the ostia and the wine, become the body and blood of Christ when the priest pronounces itself. It's transubstantiation, hopefully not to be too terribly confused with real presence. So the story goes that uh, Waldo, um, Waldo is a rich man. He said, I've had enough of this. Doesn't mean anything. Unlike the rich young ruler, who couldn't give everything up to follow Jesus because his possessions were great, Waldo gave everything up become an itinerant preacher. Um, he shunned the wealth that at the time was typically associated with the clergy. Imagine that. Clergy is a high dollar profession. That's what it was for many at the time. And Wall is aware. Aren't we supposed to be like Jesus? In life, you know, home, you no know, place to lay his head. So the movement uh, was, was known as the Poor of Leon, or the Poor of Lombardy. Um, again, characterized by lay preaching, voluntary poverty, strict adherence to the Bible. Um, okay, Lutherans, I don't, I don't mean to potentially break your hearts here. But Waldo had been commissioned, or else himself, or else in conjunction with others, translated the Bible into the common tongue of his people, which was a now extinct dialect of uh, French, but believing uh, that the common man, these most of the breed, <clears throat> should be able to read the Bible. Um, Questions and thoughts so far? Sir? Are there any copies of that translation around? We got fragments. The best of my knowledge, we have our fragments. Remember these groups, which is what I'm kind of building up to here. These groups were seriously, seriously persecuted. Um, we have very little for example from the Catholics, other than the second, third day of the mission. Um, we have, you know, lots of things that could be destroyed. Um, the Inquisition was very effective. It was extremely effective in putting down alternative points of view. The, uh, well, that is managed to survive, but now it's not damaged like some of the original artifacts. Um, Interesting way that these two movements started in France. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, a lot of theories why it is. Um, you know, far enough away from Rome, so Rome's not watching as, as, as closely. Um, kind of at the crossroads in some ways. Um, lots of reasons. I, I, actually, 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 to this day, um, um, France continues to actually be kind of a, 
hotbed of cutting edge theological uh, speculation. Um, so, Waldo goes to meet the Pope. The Pope welcomes him fairly warmly. Waldo explains what he has to say in front of a panel of clergymen. A panel of clergymen say this stuff is heresy. The Pope says, okay, Waldo, you can't preach anymore. You can't preach anymore. You didn't even bother to ask me to get both of them. You just said, you can't do this stuff anymore. Well, St. Paul, like Waldo, goes ahead and does it anyway. Um, at any rate, by the 1180s, Waldo and his followers were excommunicated, forced from land. Um, Catholic Church declares them heretics and begin to try to figure out how to get rid of them. Unlike a lot of reformers, would be reformers, or otherwise radical heretics, Waldo apparently was never captured. Um, he died uh, somewhere in the 13th century, presumably. But uh, it was very Catholic the Catholic Church. Um, presuming that's true, he was a fairly long life at the time and uh, had quite an influence. Again, this set, this pre Reformation, proto Protestant sect, the Synthists, um, very small, but there are these multi communities uh, that can still visit this day. Um, yes. Sardic communities? It doesn't exist anymore. There are none that can trace, there are none that can trace their roots back to the original Cathar movement. However, there are people who will call themselves Cathars, just like there are neo Gnostic. I didn't say neo Nazi, only got that too. But neo Gnostic movements, and those people who are self styled Gnostics of, of the cadet, uh, some of which claim to be connected to earlier Gnostics. Most of those claims are fanciful at best and outright spurious. Uh, um, I want to jump too much to them because we know it's more internet than it is. Are we this? The answer is there's a resounding. Mm. And probably reproducing it in the numbers, but it's 
seem like the way you described it, the police might say, they had to prove you got it. And that, and that makes the success of their movements all the more astounding in its time, but you can see why there would be a problem in terms of carrying that third generation. Especially the leadership is, is, uh, is a spiritual um, if, I, if, I didn't, if I didn't make that clear earlier, it's, it's in the notes. Um, <coughs> the Cathar is not like the Shakers of American historical tradition. Um, felt that, hey, we've got to stop this uh, reincarnation stuff, and the quickest, clearest way to do that is to stop the reproduction stuff. So, and besides that we believe the flesh is evil anyway, I'm not going to go into too many details because I'll start blushing, but the reality is we just said, okay, sex, at least sex that leads to pregnancy is not a good idea. Um, so they didn't have a lot of, that's not to say they didn't have some babies born. Even Shakers occasionally, uh, <laughs> they shake his cooks. I mean, sometimes things happen, you know. I was looking for a good get it. You just use this if I couldn't find um, it. Um, uh, uh, primarily, they got their members to recruit us. Imagine that. Imagine that as an evangelism technique. Hi, I'd like you to join my church. Well, okay, tell me about it. Well, let's see. We believe that uh, humanity is, is uh, really, really evil. In fact, our, our, uh, our, our whole bodies are evil. Oh, and by the way, the whole universe that you see is made by people God. But there's a good God that wants us to completely get rid of our flesh so we can become sexless spiritual beings. And when will they to stop, uh, you know, stop doing it with your husband or wife and uh, don't have any kids? How often does that sound? The length of dramatic growth is a 200 year period of slaughter. Excellent. Excellent That's where it should be. Excellent point. Where did thoughts like this come from? Usually, when religious thought turns to apocalypse, when it turns to complete transformation, when it turns to negation of what we understand to be reality, it's because the reality we experience is particularly bad, particularly ugly. You know, Let's face it, people who've got it all going on and are very happy with the fact they've got it all going on don't like to talk about the end of the world. Do they? People who are wealthy, healthy, people who are satisfied in their family lives, satisfied in their careers, how anxious are they for the end of the world? Uh, on the other hand, the person, the group, the family, who's every single day is drudgery or worse, I don't think of anyone. As the song goes, it has to be a morning after. So, yeah, excellent, excellent uh, connection there. Okay. Um, so, uh, Another, another group, by the way, another one that uh, time to time captures, uh, captures public imagination, the Knights Templar. Uh, some, some Masonic groups uh, trace their origins back to Knights Templar. Um, uh, again, uh, not to insult anybody, that's probably not historically accurate. Um, the uh, lots of new age stuff, lots of new age stuff, focusing around uh, the next Templar. Um, uh, I even call the next Templar um, play a large part of the popular if the size of the bio a series of video games. I don't know about that. I looked at the 
Crusades, the time I get to it, are over, or nearly over, this guy's got way too much power. So interestingly enough, those knights, that religious order, originally founded supposedly to protect pilgrims, also came under the scrutiny of the Inquisition. And that brings us to the Inquisition. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, this is a woodcut, an old one, a woodcut of a person being burned to say. Uh, I decided to give you a woodcut because there are some really, really awful graphic pictures. If you need graphic pictures, they're all over the place on the internet. Try to distinguish the ones which, which are actual historical things and which are colorful. The real ones are with us. This is an ugly top. I, I think this would be a good idea to explain to you about it. Uh, the chief way of executing people in the position was to uh, burn them to the um, That would be being burned a lot. Um, we'll get more into that a little bit. Before 1100, the Catholic Church had already a system of repressing heresy. What's heresy? Even a doctrine that's not considered standard. This is essentially a thought, a theological thought, a theological belief. It doesn't line up with what's considered to be the official teachings. For example, if um, if 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 if, if um, you were to suddenly say in the Lutheran Church, well, I, I don't think that getting baptized, you know, in or around the little baptismal font. Ask for somebody pours a few drops of water. I don't think that's good. I don't know that works. I, I, I think people need to have your whole body works. Just like the Baptists do. Just like the Starbucks do. I think that's good. Well, if you went out and preached that, at least with Lutheran circles, that would actually be considered a heresy. Now, you're fortunate if you did that because that probably would happen. Although sooner or later, you're almost a pastor in the case. And the reason it's going to be a heresy for the Lutheran Church, maybe not some other churches, is because the Lutheran Church holds that it is not the quality or the quantity of the water, but rather the action of God. And by you saying, no, it has to be this, you'd be taking the focus on the action that God does. The physical elements themselves. Hence, a non standard belief, a deviation, the accepted theology of the Lutheran Church. And that would take it to be a house. Well, the Catholic Church had ways of dealing with this. Um, but prior to 1100, generally did not use torture. And they generally did not execute people. Although, interestingly enough, Remember, even though I describe this as a theocracy, there are still civil authorities. And sometimes the civil authorities are found it expeditious to punish heresy with death penalty. The Roman, the Roman Catholic Church says, well, he's a heretic, we've outed him, just banished him to the far corner of the neighborhood, don't let him preach anymore. The civil government says, okay. This guy's a troublemaker. Okay, rid of him. Um, but in, in general, in general, executions were few and far between, and some are rare. Now we get to the 12th century, and this Cathar movement is spreading all over this, particularly in the southern parts of Europe. But it's working its way everywhere. That's why I went into such great detail on the So to understand what it was, it's so upset my own wrong. They'll look at this stuff and say, well, these people got these crazy satanic beliefs, and everybody's going after them. 
everybody, everybody sees each other. Well, I'll follow these guys. Man, we're the children. We're going to stamp this out. So, the Inquisition is dead. Very first Inquisition, 1184. Now, mind you, this is happening. This is happening while the Crusades are still going on. Well, those powers were self. Very first Inquisition, so called Episcopal Inquisition. Episcopal simply means of bishops. Okay? So the bishops were kind of left in charge. Then it became a papal Inquisition. Um, how do you get to 1229? Inquisition was permanently established as a fixture within the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, this is how we do theological justice. Um, 1252, Pope Innocent IV. Again, yeah, Pope's these great names. <laughs> Pope Innocent IV. Not the name, is it? Pope Innocent IV in 1252 says, you know what, in order to get the truth, we need to use some strong interrogation methods. Some enhanced interrogation methods. Don't forget that, we need torture people. Paul says. And all this money. 
army is going to funnel right back into the concert series. Including, by the way, the people who are in the church who will be invited to the concert series. And all of a sudden, the church treasurer wants to audit all of us. So, so we have to, yeah, I'm just sure. I'm pretty proud of something. Go ahead, man, read the week. who are contributing to this thing, you've got people from the church who are giving fairly sizable gifts to your concert series, and if they're giving gifts to your concert series, they won't be giving gifts to the things that we'll let them be giving gifts to. They don't have so much money. You see, John Q. Brishner figures he wants to tithe. And maybe his tithe works out to seems a round number. It works out to be 100 bucks a month. And we'll talk about it. It's high, it's not. Well, in his mind, if he gives that money to the ladies' aid society, puts it in the plate of the general fund, throws it in the plate of the concert to the music fund, as far as he is concerned, he's given a hundred bucks to work with God. He's, this concert's clear, he's going to bar out of the drink. <laughs> but as far as the treasurer is concerned, that money went out, that money went out so that you could pay some. some Long haired musician friend of yours and didn't go to the new flagstones we need for our peace garden. Did you get the point? No. No? <laughs> what you say is that you should be suspect of the possible of others spending money? No, I don't think that that I don't think 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 uh, but it, it is a flawed example because it's, you know, hundreds of years later. But I use it as an example of why the Catholic Church was annoyed, in fact, very angry with these Knights nice Templar. Because people are giving money out of their pockets to Knights nice Templar, and the analogy, flawed one, I admit, the analogy was that people in this little parish were all of a sudden giving money to the concert series instead of, or at least hypothetically instead of, I never bothered to compare what the books were, because they just shut the concert series down. But, um, but the point is that, you know, there's only so many resources. Okay. And if it's going to one thing, it can't be going to something else. Now, I'm not, in fact, even if you subject me to the middle of the torture, I'm not going to tell you what I think the best use of your money is. Uh, but, what I can tell you is that historically, the Roman Catholic Church is not happy with all the money that was going to the Knights Templar, who are now no longer riding two knights to a horse, but now have two horses to a knight. No, seriously, they had stables with beautiful horses and beautiful armor. And really, really well appointed, really well appointed everything else. And the Roman Church is saying, hey, wait a minute, if that money's going there, can't be coming here. That's the analogy. Yeah, it's more funny. I think it holds up pretty well in terms of seeing the reason. Yeah. Very much. Um, but no, if I, if I gave, by the way, if I gave the impression that you should or should not trust your church council and else's, if I gave the impression that I would tell you your money should go, concerts or non concerts, or flags or anything else, I don't know. That wasn't my question. Did not. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave off with, with, with the Inquisition here because I got to cover at least a little bit of the exciting black play. Um, I mean, we won't get to all that, but I want to leave off because the Inquisition, as I mentioned, was on for a long, long time. Technically, it doesn't end in the six. In Europe? In Europe? Yeah. Well, everywhere, 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 technically. Everywhere, technically. You know what's interesting is, even in the Protestant churches, and we start with the end of the Reformation, the last two weeks, of course, the spirit of the Inquisition remained. In, in this country, land of pretty home away, the spirit of the Inquisition remains. That's probably without kind of our time period. But the reality 
is um, <coughs> sale Massachusetts. Okay, no, same, same product. Same product. Okay. What are you supposed to get out of it? Okay, so, so the reality is that the idea of using torture to extract the truth, uh, by the way, you can put in the Another analogy, granted, with law talk. Hopefully, more things get lost. So, I'm the annoying geeky kid growing up. You're not, not me, the annoying geeky kid. I'm the annoying geeky kid, okay? Now, I was very tall, but it wasn't very thin. It was probably even harder than that. <laughs> so, the kids in the neighborhood, the, the, the toughs, the, you know, the, the, the they, 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 they like they, at first like to pick on them. So I gotta clean this up a little bit. Okay. So I'll put it in the old kind of how you do these sort of line, which they, you know, so so again, I'm going to come with my big book bookcase full of books, and all of a sudden somebody jumps on my head and then lands on me. And a bunch of his friends are landing on me too, and they're punching. And, and, and they're, they said, say all that. It is something you want to ask me. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you. They you know, the say all And they don't want to do it because I don't want them to win. They're moral and they're strong and they I got my pride. What are they doing? They're using torture to extract their version of the truth. Their version of the truth, why should it be? It's not a message. You see, when you're gentle, oh, gentle, it was like quiet. You know, it's funny, it's the kids will start to uh, question your sexuality long before they even know what sexuality is. What the heck am I stepping in now? But now these kids, I mean, I must have been eight years old, and they're pounding me and saying, come on, admit it, admit it, you're a you're a fat. Mm -hmm. Admit it. You just get down and this so bad. I don't want to admit that. Because I was being around a lot, and I had a pretty good idea what that was. That was, a, that was kind of an English slide for cigarettes. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> now I'm damned if I'm going to admit I'm a cigarette. <laughs> oh, sorry, I have to have a note on something. Um, and, uh, but they were trying to put in their, their truth, their version of the truth, admit this. Admit this. You really know what it is. Really know what it is. Just admit it. Come on now, stop now, stop me. Just admit it. Just admit it. Just admit it. And I'm going to say, what? Let's see. These are kids who probably didn't know anything about the Inquisition. They probably didn't know anything about getting a light. It's just something endemic in us. It's just something endemic. This is what when we, we want somebody to admit our version of truth. And we resort to something that no self respecting animal will ever do. We want the physical premise. Yet, yeah. no wonder we just watch. Okay, we're going to talk part two of, of this um, stuff. We'll get into, by the way, the Spanish Inquisition. We're going to try to figure out how to talk about that. Let's see, all the nightmares. Okay, what time are we up to? 10 minutes. Black leg. Black leg. All right, well, how about something for us? Who would have got? The company would have got. Dan's a cop. Uh, Dan's death. Dr. scholarship suggests that 45% of the European population is wiped out of the world. And almost every other person. So, 
death is ever present. The idea of the dance of death, something that um, has continued me as a pain, is the arts. Right? Very common in those pieces called that. Um, speaks of a commonality of death. <coughs> something you all may accept. You see our friends a lot of the time, you know, a But here, this particular thing, death was all around. So, play. It's said to be called like the Senia Pestis. Commonly present in populations of fleas. Fleas. Here's the theory an infected flea. It's just all the time it's better. It just, it just carries it. It doesn't follow the flea, I mean, not one bit. Infected flea decides to. Get itself into the fur of a rat. Well, the flea marginally uh, bothers a rat, but not because of the disease, not because of the pestis disease, but because the flea is trying to, you know, chew on the rat. But the rat doesn't care that much. Now the rat gets itself into a shipping container, into a carriage, the bottom of the boat. Eventually, finds his way to Europe. Flea, eventually, gets tired of that, goes to something else, even medium. I think it's medium. And there's the play. Um, that's at least one theory of it. There are a few. Um, my guess, just a guess, probably a combination of things. Most likely a combination of things. Um, thoughts and disease, probably travel, or so called Silk Road. Um, with the armies, I don't know. Um, at the end of 1346, reports of the plague had reached the uh, seaports of Europe. This is a quote from somebody's letter. India was depopulated. Tartary, Mesopotamia, Syria, and Armenia were covered with dead bodies. Um, so play, I'll be back up, um, play first finds its way into, um, into Italy, mostly because that was, that was the big sequence, the big sequence, the big train was there. Play comes into Italy. From Italy, spreads across Europe, striking probably in this order, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, um, ultimately, Scandinavia, as far away as Norway, Iceland, and Russia, by 1351. They talk about rampant disease. They think about how far apart those places are and what's between them. And the way you have to use, what you have to use to get to those places. And then there's plenty of things there. Okay. Three kinds of plague. The first one is the bubonic version. It's not going to just call the whole thing the bubonic plague, that's just a misnomer. Okay? Bubonic plague comes from uh, tumors. Tumors. Uh, that was the first kind of plague. You would make these tumors, you would the neck, uh, groin, extremities, uh, uh, Once you got that, Without medication, it wasn't. You would use your diet with uh, a little less. Occasionally, occasionally was fine. Very good. Um, tumors range in size, not about an egg. What happened? Huge, ugly tumors appearing in your body within a matter of days. Um, the uh, second variation was the so called demonic plague. That was translated uh, just, just by breathing. Infected air. Um, once you got that, you probably had a few days ago. Um, 
Finally, the second static version, which packed one system, uh, transmitted to bottom fruits, um, saliva, blood, and so on. Um, folks have no idea They knew nothing about epidemiology. Any medical knowledge had long since been lost. So they're confused. They're, they're destroyed. Here's a uh, one. Here's a little bit here. Um, here's my survival. Um, I'm running 13 million threats. <laughs> Such fear and fanciful notions took possession of the living, and almost all of them adopted the same cruel policy, which is entirely to avoid the sick and everything wrong with them. And doing so, each one thought he was cure his own safety. One citizen avoided another, hardly any neighbor troubled others, relatives never or hardly ever visited each other. Moreover, such terror was struck in the hearts of men of the most calamity, the brother of Adam's brother, the uncle of his nephew, and the sister her brother, and very often the wife her husband. What is even worse, and really incredible, is that fathers and mothers refused to see and have their children as if they had not been theirs. He goes on to write, such was the multitude of corpses brought to churches every day, almost every hour, that there was not enough consecrated ground for the burial, especially since they wanted to bury each person in the family of grave according to old custom. Although the cemeteries were full, they were forced to dig huge trenches where they buried the bodies by the hundreds. They were thrown away like a balance and holding the ship. Covered in a little earth, and the whole trench was full. That, by the way, uh, comes out of a, uh, a story of this survivor of the plague wrote. He writes a story, a kind of really novel, about seven people who flee from their town and uh, survive of the plague. So he's writing this kind of a historical fiction, so to speak, um, in the 14th century. And uh, so the last point for right now. Um, so, the play one of his books. The play one of his books. And by the way, there were other outbreaks of the same disease, each with successively less damage done to the populace. Uh, two reasons. One, probably has to be the immune system. But maybe more significantly, medicine, and especially sanitation, like that. Um, it would be difficult for us in the 21st century to overestimate, not not moral necessarily, but uh, physically, how absolutely filthy the world was. It was a. Well, one of the reasons why we call the Dark Ages the Dark Ages is how much 
knowledge was lost. Um, and at some point, in the remaining few weeks, we'll talk about that. But to give you an idea, the Roman city of Crete is sent here for Christ and a form of primitive indoor plumbing. So they come out of this, and there's a period of religious fervor. I'm kind of picking up right after that one. 
Number 11? You know where you were? I know where I was. I was in the George Washington Bridge. Beautiful view of the Hudson River. Beautiful view of downtown Manhattan. Beautiful view of what's happening. Well, it didn't take long, a day or so, for the churches to be full. And I haven't seen a lot of them in my own life. <coughs> that next Sunday, we had to put out chairs, everybody. Okay? And there were American flags everywhere. And there were prayers everywhere. Pretty soon, Republicans and Democrats, all kinds of other autocrats were praying with each other. We live as fervor. In the wake of a tragedy, does not make decisions. So that's what happened here. All of a sudden, there's this religious fervor. But I want you to think about this. Religious fervor almost invariably gives way to the desire to blame someone. Dare I say that was a bad destruction? Religious fervor gives way to a need for a scapegoat. And they found one. Um, Europeans begin to target outside the roofs. The Jews. Again, the Jews. Uh, they targeted, um, they used to be on prior with the Calvary monks. They targeted the numbers, they somehow played the numbers to play, and not well connected. Um, they, 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 they targeted anybody who was outside of themselves. The past for scientific community had no clue. So they then turned to astrological forces. Apparently, three planets, such as you can see them today, but I don't know what else was. Three planets lined up beautifully. Someone called out the home. The sign of God. Ultimately, people say it must be God's punishment. It must be God's punishment for something we're allowing in our society. Um, last paragraph. Numerous attacks against Jewish communities. August 1349. Plagues just barely over. Jewish communities are destroyed. Jews had a thousand killed. They were claimed to be some cars. Next week, next week we'll talk about uh, the second half of the Inquisition, and that'll bring us right up to the uh, meeting for Reformation. And um, that's next week. Questions? Questions? Anyone? Okay. That's not the room at all. Father, we thank you for this time that you allow us, or sometimes as we look at our own history, it is difficult. Thank you all. Thank you.